human beings, Power Gamer here, and as an unofficial member of the MPAA, the morons patronizing across America, I've been tasked with scouring various video games to make sure they're suitable for all audiences, and banning any ones that don't fit the criteria, because if a four-year-old can't play it, why should anyone else? Too messy, too violent, too sexual, too garbage, too, uh, hmm. Well, I'm actually not really sure about this one. I guess I'll have to thoroughly inspect it. No More Heroes, insanity at its finest. While not one of the most well-known properties, it is easily one of the most unique identities you'll ever find in a video game. It was directed and designed by Goichi Suda, better known by his nickname, Suda51, and developed by his company, Grasshopper Manufacturer. It was originally planned as an Xbox 360 game, but developer Yasuhiro Wada suggested they could instead develop it for the Wii due to the console's unique controller. Suda51 based a majority of elements in the game on various pieces of pop culture, including celebrities like Johnny Knoxville, Scarlett Johansson, and Charles Bronson, as well as films like Memento, Spaceballs, and Dirty Harry. In one interview, he stated he essentially wanted to make an even more violent version of the game Manhunt 2. Yes, this man took a look at this game and said, we can go even further. Although only the North American version of this game actually had blood in it. Europe and Japan had it censored with black clouds and coins. The game was released on December 6, 2007 in Japan, with other countries getting it in the following months. It was generally well received by a lot of people and got a decent decent amount of attention for being one of the first M-rated Wii games since the console was primarily aimed at families. Although it initially didn't sell too well in Japan, it did much better overseas, with half of the game's shipments that were sent to North America being sold out in its first week. The game was later ported to the PS3, PC, the Nintendo Switch, and even the Amazon Luna. I'm the first person to say that all year! It was followed up with a sequel released in 2010, and another sequel and spin-off both released for the Switch later on. I've been aware of this game for a while, but I never actually played it myself. I did always find it kind of interesting, though. I mean, it's not very often a game like this comes out for the Wii, so it's time to finally see what I've been missing for all these years. The game follows Travis Touchdown, a stereotypical otaku obsessed with anime, video games, and wrestling who lives in the fictional town of Santa Destroya. After winning an internet auction for a beam katana, the friendliest form of plagiarism I've ever seen, Travis winds up out of money. So he does what any broke 20-year-old would do, turn to murder. Travis meets a woman named Sylvia, and she convinces him to join the United Assassins Association, or UAA. Under her recommendation, he strives to become the number one rated assassin in the world, because he believes if he does so, he'll be able to play some poker with her. Yeah, the story's pretty ridiculous, but that's totally the point. This game knows what it is, and it goes all the way with it. It is an absurd, over-the-top gore fest with a distinct anime style, comedic writing, and more blood than Mortal Kombat's time of the month. Travis may look like a badass, but he is the durability of a freaking cartoon character. He gets blasted, beaten, and blown up multiple times, and isn't affected at all. This game is dumb fun in all the right ways, and never takes itself too seriously, and I really like that. I mean, what else would you expect from the guy who went on to make a game where you play as a cheerleader? or killing zombies. But this style isn't just for the story, it truly shines with the visuals. I love this game's art direction. It is one of the most distinct looking games I have ever seen, especially for the Wii. A single look at any of the characters and you'll know exactly what game you're playing. But sadly, the game doesn't run too well. I had a decent amount of frame rate drops. The soundtrack fits really well, though I honestly can't remember any of it. And the voice acting is fantastic. It feels like everyone is giving it their all. Now I'm sure the mere mention of a katana implies that this is a hack and slash game, and that assumption is correct. And it being on the Wii implies that you have to swing the Wii remote for every single attack, and thankfully that assumption is not correct. Travis is set on killing the top 10 ranked assassins, but for some reason he has to kill a bunch of other people along the way. Because come on, we can't have the only enemies in the game be the boss fights. What do you think this is, Shadow of the Colossus? We are far too sophisticated for that. This game actually has a really unique combat system. You primarily attack enemies by pressing the A button, but once an enemy runs out of health, time slows down and you're shown an arrow on screen. If you then swing the Wii remote in the direction the arrow is pointing, you'll slash the enemy, turning them into a blood fountain. Every time you do a slash attack, this little slot bar will spin at the bottom of the screen. If you get three matching icons, you'll unleash a super attack, which will help you defeat enemies even faster. Getting three bells puts the game in an over-the-shoulder perspective, letting you slice any enemy in one hit and shoot energy blasts. Three bars makes everything in black and white, and you have to press the correct button to kill enemies immediately. Three fires sends you into overdrive, making you completely invincible and letting you decimate anything. Three cherries turns everything dark so you can sneak up on enemies, and three sevens gives you an energy blast, which you can only activate by pressing the minus button, something the game neglects to tell you. The super attacks only last a short period of time, but they are really fun to use. But sadly, weapons you buy from internet auctions aren't always reliable. I know I learned that the hard way. Bang! 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 bang. 
every time you strike an enemy with the beam katana, some of its battery will be drained. Once it runs out, it's as useful as a wet twig. So you have to keep recharging it by pressing the one button and swinging the Wii remote back and forth. You can do this as much as you want, so as long as you're paying attention, you should be fine. And yes, we all know it looks like Travis is shaking a bottle of soda when he does it. And if you hold the A button, you can charge your attack, letting you do more damage, although it takes a lot of battery life. But the beam katana isn't your only method of defense. If you press the B button, you punch or kick the enemy, which can make them dizzy. If they see stars, you can press the B button again to perform a wrestling move by shifting the Wii remote and nunchuck in the corresponding directions. Doing this will remove a huge chunk of health, and if it doesn't outright kill them, you can then press the A button to finish them off with a direct stab to the face. I definitely prefer using the standard attack, but the wrestling moves are still a cool way to take out enemies. You can use the Z button to lock on enemies, block their attacks, and dodge out of the way by pressing the D-pad. If you dodge at just the right time, they'll freeze, letting you kill them easily. I guess Bayonetta isn't the only one capable of which time. There's four types of enemies that you'll typically run into. Ones with no weapons, ones with guns that run away like a little wuss, ones with melee weapons, and ones with these annoying purple bars that can easily block your attacks. You have two different stances of attacks, high and low. Which one you're using is determined by holding the Wii remote horizontally or vertically. Depending on how enemies with weapons are holding them, they can block your attacks, which wastes battery life. So you'll want to be cautious until you figure out what stance you need to use, because otherwise you'll just waste time and energy. But if you and an enemy clash weapons at the exact same time, you'll then enter dual mode, where you have to spin the Wii remote around in circles as fast as possible. If you overpower the enemy, you'll be able to slash them, knocking them out immediately. The combat for this game is overall really fun. Sure, it's pretty simple, but it's insanely fast-paced, and the fact that you're spilling blood every five seconds makes it super chaotic. It's really addicting trying to kill enemies as fast as possible. My only complaint is that sometimes the wrestling moves and finishers can be a bit finicky. There were multiple times where I was pressing the button and it just did not count. But all this time I've been talking about the combat. Most games of this genre typically break up combat sequences with puzzles in between. This one, however, does something very, very different. The combat sequences are all split into separate levels, and each of them end with a boss fight against the assassin ranked above Travis. Every time he kills one, he talks with Sylvia for a bit, and then you're sent back to the motel he lives in. And when you step outside, the game becomes a watered-down GTA clone. You have to travel around Santa Destroy on Travis's ridiculous-looking motorcycle. I smell compensation! You're free to explore anywhere in the city, but your main objective is to make money. In order to unlock the next fight, Travis has to pay a fee to the UAA. You do get money in the levels, but it is never enough to unlock the next one. So you have to go to this job center and complete manual labor tasks like picking up trash and collecting coconuts. Depending on how well you do, you're given a paycheck, and once you have enough money, you can unlock the next fight. After each level, a new job is unlocked, so you do get more as you go along. This is the most common complaint I see people have with this game, and I'm sure you're expecting me to complain about this too, but you'd actually be surprised that you're absolutely right. I don't like these. Yep, no shocking twist here, these stink. Okay, they're not the worst thing in the world since it actually only takes a few minutes to do each one, but there's just nothing to them. They're incredibly basic and not interesting in the slightest. I will admit the idea of some master assassin having to mow someone's lawn is pretty funny, but these things completely overstay their welcome. Now thankfully the jobs aren't the only way to make money. Once you complete a job for the first time, you can go to this assassin center and get paid to kill some random goons. These can range from just killing as many as possible under a time limit, to killing one in particular, to killing enemies with a specific technique. These are much more fun since they actually relate to what the game is about, and they make a lot more money. But even these can overstay their welcome, since there aren't that many of them and you have to do them constantly. It wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for the fact that traveling around the city gets pretty tedious. It's not that big, and you always have access to Travis's motorcycle, but there's no way to fast travel in this game. You have to drive to every single location you want to go to. And there aren't that many things to do in the overworld, you're just going from place to place. Hell, you spend more time traveling than actually doing your tasks. Because first you have to go to the correct center, go inside, select a job or a mission, go to the spot marked on the map, do your task, and then go all the way back to do another one if you still need more money. You have to do this for every single level, and it can take just as long to raise money, if not longer, than the actual combat sequences and boss fights. So roaming around the city and doing random odd jobs and assassination missions literally takes up half of the game. Even when you have all the money you need, you don't just get the next mission right away, no, 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 no. You have to drive to an ATM, deposit the money, then go to the motel, which is thankfully right next to it, but still, go inside and get a call from Sylvia, and then you can finally go to the location of the next fight. Why? That just overcomplicates things. Why couldn't I just get the call at the ATM, or better yet, just give me the option to pay as soon as I get the money? Each aspect of this whole process doesn't take long on its own, but it all adds up to just drag on for way too long. 
wrong. It doesn't feel fun, it feels like padding. Thankfully, there are other places in town you can go to where you can spend your money on upgrades. There's Dr. Nimona's lab who will sell you new bean katanas and parts that increase your attack and battery life, reuse gym where you can lift weights and do squats to increase your combos, health, and strength, the Beef Head, which is a video store that sells you tapes letting you learn new wrestling moves, the Area 51 clothing store, which just sells you clothes, yeah, I never bought any since they're purely cosmetic, and the bar. The bar has this drunk old man who will teach you new wrestling moves if you bring him seven of these Lovakov balls that are scattered across Santa Destroya. Honestly, I didn't feel the need to do this. You get enough wrestling moves from the tapes and progressing throughout the game. This just felt like a waste of time to me. And speaking of a waste of time, most of these upgrades are quite expensive, so if you want to get them, which I'm sure that you do, you have to do more jobs and more assassination missions. Lovely. But wait, there's also these free fight missions you unlock after doing jobs where you have to kill a bunch of enemies without getting hit once. Yeah, I didn't do these. Once you finally do make enough money, each level typically follows the same formula. You get a call from Sylvia telling you where the next location is, drive there, fight a bunch of enemies, get another call from Sylvia right before the boss, which actually comes out of the Wii Remote speaker, that's pretty cool, fight the boss, get a chest which gives you money and increases your maximum health, then speak with Sylvia who tells you you've gone up in rank. You're then sent back to the motel where you get two messages on Travis's answering machine. One is from a woman named Diane who tells Travis he needs to return something lewd to a video store, and the other is from the UAA telling him he needs to pay a fee. The levels are filled with chests that restore your health, restore your battery, give you money, or give you a trading card card, which is a pointless collectible. Once the enemies are all dead, the game stops to a halt for the Sylvia call. It's neat at first, but it gets old since it's basically the same thing every time. You are approaching your next opponent. Make sure you are ready. If you win, you move up in the rank. If you lose, you go to hell. I am random percent confident that you are going to die. Good luck and head for the Garden of Madness. You then get some more chests and can save the game by <laughs> using the toilet. Okay, that's pretty funny. After saving, you find a wrestling mask with a note in it that teaches you a new wrestling move. When you go back to the motel, there's a handful of things you can do. You can change Travis's clothes in the closet, examine your weapons in his drawer, save the game on the toilet, watch the wrestling tapes on his TV along with the trailer for the game, that's a neat bonus feature, view your trading card collection, and best of all, play with his pet cat, Genie. Hey girl. Now normally I would start discussing the levels, but if this game taught me anything, it's that the jobs take priority, so let's go over those first. The first one you unlock is collecting coconuts. You have to punch and kick trees so they fall, and mash the A button to carry them back. Next is lawn mowing. Hold A to go forward, B to go backward, and twist the Wii Remote to turn. Picking up garbage, you have to walk up to it, hit the A button, and swing the Wii Remote to put the trash away. Next up is filling cars with gas. Huh, I thought this game took place in California, but nope, looks like it actually takes place in New Jersey. Just hold the B button until it gets to the arrow, but you can't hold it too long, or or else. Now the next basic job is obviously clearing out mines from a beach. Use this metal detector to find them, then hit the A button. Cleaning graffiti. You walk up to it, swing the Wii remote, and then swing the nunchuck. Honestly, the annoying part is just finding them. Next, you can find lost cats by walking up to them and playing by swinging the Wii remote. Well, this is the best job so far. Now, if removing mines wasn't dangerous enough, we need to collect scorpions. It's the same thing as the trash, only they move and can sting you, so you have to run back to the guy running the job for an antidote or else you die. And finally, bike jumping. Ride your motorcycle off this ramp and swing the Wii remote up to jump. Okay, now we can get into the levels. Immediately you start the game in this mansion. Nothing too interesting here other than a tutorial. Your first opponent is number 10, a rich old guy named Death Metal. He has this giant sword, and really there's nothing complicated about him. He's a glorified boss fight tutorial. Sylvia then tells Travis he's in the top 10 ranked assassins, and he can't back out because people will be coming after him to take his spot. Number 9 lies in a baseball stadium where you have to actually play baseball a couple of times. Enemies will throw a ball, and you have to whack it, sending it flying through their skulls. The boss is an insane scientist named Dr. Peace. He shoots you, and you can only hurt him after he fires. Now you have to go to a school, and the only thing interesting here is the sprinkler system, which shorts out the bean katana. Number eight is a child ninja named Shinobu who thinks Travis killed her father. Spoiler, he didn't. She is super fast. You really need to make sure which stance you're using and avoid these sonic waves. And this is where I got my first death. It just sends you back to your last checkpoint. Travis decides to not kill her, though, since he wants to see her grow up and become a better opponent. I'm sure that won't lead to anything bad. To reach the next one, you have to take the subway, and fight through a bunch of train cars before reaching this warehouse. Here you meet Number 7, a psychotic superhero named Destroy Man, and he's ironically voiced by Spider-Man. We're both fighters, aren't we? Not killers, at least for now. This is a sign of sportsmanship, that we respect each other before and after the fight. He shocks you, slams the ground, shoots energy blasts, and fires a giant laser. And now Travis is back to murder. Number six is on a beach which is filled with landmines because of course it is. She's a model slash war vet with a prosthetic leg named Holly Summers. She hits you with a shovel, fires missiles at you, where is she keeping these things, and digs holes to trap you. Travis is hesitant to kill her, so she just blows up her head, leading Travis to bury her. I know it sounds like I'm just glossing over the levels, but there's really not much to say about them, 
from the boss fights. You fight a bunch of enemies, and that's it. Killing her lets you get the secret military weapon, which you can take to Dr. Naomi. You can then purchase a new beam katana, but first you have to get this other one that lets you do these super slashes to kill multiple enemies. Next, you have to go out into the middle of this field and head down a mine shaft. This area kind of blows, since you just fight the same enemies over and over again. But once you make it out, you find number five. Let's shake. A crazy rock star with this giant machine that he doesn't actually get to use because a guy named Henry, who also has a beam katana, shows up and kills him. Travis is pissed he stole his kill, but Sylvia tells him it doesn't matter and he still goes up in rank. I am really starting to question how this system works, but it doesn't really matter since now I get the beam katana Dr. Naomi built from the military weapon. This one makes it so basic enemies can't block your attacks. Then you have to take the subway again, but this time it randomly becomes a 2D shooter. You move, shoot, slash, and bomb. It's simple, but fun! The train takes you to a magic show where Travis spends a lovely evening with Sylvia. He's then invited on stage, and unsurprisingly, the magician is ranked number four, Harvey Volodarsky. And here we find out Travis's parents are dead. Harvey slashes at you, teleports, and flips the stage upside down. Don't you love it when games do this because they almost always reverse the controls. We're near the end of the line, and number three requires a bus to get to. It's like the subway, only now you're contained to just one location. Travis sees his old master, who is so pointless and out of nowhere I don't even remember his name, and I am not going to look it up, because he's immediately killed by an old witch lady named Speedbuster. This is the easiest fight in the game, you just need to move forward and duck to the side to avoid this giant laser that doesn't hurt you, it just pushes you back. Travis grabs the sword, and now we have to go back to the stadium. They were really running out of locations. But this one is a bit unique, since you take your motorcycle with you to play a game of Death Race. Number two is the psychotic girl with a bat named Bad Girl. Name of the year, human beings. She smacks you, hits enemies into you, and you have to run away when she falls to the ground because if you get too close, it's instant death. You then return to the motel, and now I can get the final beam katana, which is insanely fast and does tons of damage. After paying the last fee, he gets a call from a woman claiming to be Sylvia's mother. She reveals that there is no UAA and that this whole thing was a complete scam. If I had a nickel for every time I heard that. But Travis decides he might as well finish what he started and become number one. His motorcycle gets stolen though, so you have to walk across most of Santa Destroya to get to the final location. Hmm. That was a lot more padding than necessary. Get the motorcycle back, board the highway and avoid crates, and make your way through this forest where you have to pick the correct paths or else it repeats. Then you finally make it to the invisible castle of Darkstar, the number one ranked assassin in the world. Here he claims that he's Travis's father. What a twist! We get a flashback and find out Travis met Sylvia in a bar after his parents were killed and he actually set out on this quest for revenge. But then Darkstar is killed prematurely by this girl. She reveals that Darkstar isn't Travis's father because she's the one who killed his parents. Travis asks her why she killed them, and we fast forward through her backstory. <laughs> okay, that is hilarious. And it's revealed that she is Travis's sister, Jean. What a twist! Now it's time to settle this once and for all. She moves insanely fast and dodges most of your attacks, so you really need to rely on charge attacks. The two are neck and neck, but then Shinobu comes out of nowhere and cuts off Jean's hands, allowing Travis to kill her. The old deus ex machina. With that, Travis has officially become the number one ranked assassin but he sadly didn't get that poker game he was promised. Travis returns home to use the toilet, as one does after almost being murdered, and if you choose the real ending, he'll be attacked by some dude and saved by Henry. He tells Travis to meet him outside and- wait, we're still going?! Yep, Henry is the real final boss, and he dodges your attacks like Jean and has instant death like Bad Girl. Once you beat him, he reveals he's Travis's twin brother and Sylvia is his wife. Yeah, I'm not doing the twist thing again. It doesn't deserve it. Turns out Sylvia has a habit of conning people since Henry doesn't make enough money. Travis implies he actually did play poker with Sylvia, and the two run off and clash swords. We freeze frame as the credits roll, and then it zooms out to reveal a painting being looked at by d d Sylvia and her daughter, who is also named Jean, and then it just stops? Well, that was... an ending.
Heroes is a fun game, but it is really bogged down by the money-making stuff. It wouldn't be as bad if it was quicker, but like I said earlier, it can take just as long to reach the levels as it does to actually play them. Sometimes longer if you want to get most of the upgrades. I did enjoy playing this game, but I don't see myself playing it again anytime soon. It gets really repetitive, especially towards the end. From what I've heard, the sequel is a lot better in this department, so I guess I have something to look forward to when I eventually play that. But for now, I'm still pretty salty about that ridiculous ending. I mean, out of all the ways you could have gone out, why the hell would anyone choose to go out with that?